Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's 40th Virtual YMCA Education Series program with the North Suburban YMCA. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I am a personal trainer and the adult program coordinator at the NSYMCA in Northbrook, Illinois. This evening's presentation entitled Understanding Foot and Ankle Pain is being recorded so that you will be able to revisit it again. Please feel free to tell your friends and family about it so that they too can view it once it is posted on either the IBJI or NSYMCA websites. As you probably know, the foot and ankle are a series of complex joints involved in walking, running, jumping, and so much more. Each foot and ankle provides stability and balance to your body and consists of 26 bones, 33 joints, and many muscles, tendons, and ligaments. If any one of those is injured, it's harder for your foot to function properly, which can impact your ability to stabilize, balance, and do everyday activities, not to mention more demanding movements like exercise, dance, sports, etc. Luckily for us, Dr. Garo Immersion is here tonight to teach us about the symptoms, causes, diagnosis, and treatment options for foot and ankle pain from the seemingly simple to more complex conditions. Garo Immersion DPM is an Illinois Bone and Joint Institute board certified podiatric surgeon with fellowship training in foot and ankle reconstruction. He has been practicing with IBJI for more than 20 years and specializes in foot surgery and reconstructive rear foot and ankle surgery. Dr. Immersion's practice covers a broad spectrum of care from conservative options to surgery for issues such as nail disorders, hammer toes, bunions, heel pain, nerve problems, pediatric and adult foot deformities, diabetic foot concerns, easy for me to say, gout, skin conditions, fractures, traumatic injuries, arthritis of the foot and ankle, and much, much more. Dr. Immersion is a local guy, having received his DPM at the William M. Scholl College of Podiatric Medicine in Chicago. He did his internship at Cook County Hospital in Chicago and his residency in podiatric surgery at Edgewater Medical Center Day Surgery Centers in, you guessed it, Chicago. Finally, he did his fellowship in foot and ankle reconstruction with Illinois Bone and Joint Institute in Park Ridge, Illinois. Dr. Immersion has his own experience with a foot deformity as well as foot and ankle injuries he sustained as a division one football player at Northern Illinois University where he is in the sports hall of fame. Therefore, he can not only empathize with but also is able to sympathize with his patients varying foot and ankle conditions because he has faced his own. He says, as a doctor of podiatric medicine, I diagnose and treat both simple and complex foot and ankle conditions. I treat you with the same care and concern and attention that I would give to my own family members. I believe in listening to, communicating with, and educating you as we work together to return you to the highest level of function possible. And in return, Dr. Immersion has received a lot of praise from patients. One Google reviewer said, his bedside manner was the best in all caps. Dr. Garo makes you feel very comfortable, like you're at home. I would recommend him all the time. He puts your mind at ease, and then again in all caps, it says, great person. Another said, I want to thank him for his professionalism and his good sense of humor. He was very direct and to the point. And finally, my favorite, Dr. Immersion was my roommate for two years at podiatry school. He was two years ahead of me and was a good teacher back then. He always had integrity and was serious about learning the complex skills necessary to fix most foot and ankle conditions. He even had a decent three-point shot. Don't hesitate to make an appointment with this doctor. I'm better, but I'm in Michigan and can't help you. This was by Steve Sheridan, DPM, Bashudi. Clearly, Dr. Immersion is loved even by his competitors. I anticipate we'll have fun with him tonight. During Dr. Immersion's presentation this evening, you might find that you have questions for him, which he will be happy to address at the end of the program. Simply type your questions into the question section on your screen and I will receive them and relay them to Dr. Immersion immediately following his presentation. I do ask that you please keep your questions general as Dr. Immersion will not be able to address individual concerns without individual consultation. If you do have self-specific questions, please contact Dr. Immersion via one of the options that will be listed on the slide during the Q&A portion at the end of his presentation. One last thing before I turn the podium over to Dr. Immersion, I invite you to mark your calendar for our next IBJI and YMCA Education Series program. On Wednesday, June 21st at 7 p.m., Dr. Kevin Hayek will host Acute and Chronic Knee Pain. Hope you'll be able to join us. Thank you again for joining us tonight, 
And thank you, Dr. Garo Immersion, for your time and effort in putting together this program to help us learn more about the symptoms, causes, and treatment of foot and ankle pain. Now, Dr. Immersion, please take it from here. Thank you very much, Karen, for that introduction. I appreciate that. My pleasure. So I'd like to thank everybody uh, for, for coming into this uh, live web webinar, uh, taking time out of your day or evening after dinner to, to listen to me. I uh, also like to thank a couple people here at IBGI, Emma Chandler for helping me set this up, uh, Lori Jensen for putting this together, Ryan Clausen uh, for the tech side of this and helping me with that, as well as Darcy Grum and Karen, who uh, get a, thank you for the gracious introduction. I appreciate that. Um, the topic of this lecture is things that cause uh, foot and ankle pain. Uh, it's something that it's going to be a very broad overview of, of uh, foot and ankle issues, uh, starting with the, the tips of the toes, working all the way back to the ankle. Um, so you don't have to go to Google. You can just watch this lecture and you'll be good. Um, <clears throat> okay. So uh, we're going to start out. This was one of my patients, and uh, this was his dog, Sweet Pea. And uh, he came to the office one day and uh, he brought his dog and he was telling me about Sweet Pea and Sweet Pea jumps rope. And Sweet Pea is actually pretty uh, famous. Uh, he was on David Letterman's show and, and multiple uh, uh, other shows. Um, and, and hopefully someday, you know, everybody will be able to get to dance like uh, Sweet Pea did. First of all, I'm a podiatric surgeon. Questions that I always get is what's a podiatric surgeon and what do they do? It's a doctor who treats medical and surgical disorders of the foot and ankle. Um, what's the training of a, a, a DPM or doctor of podiatric medicine? Four years of undergrad, four years of podiatry, and one to three years of postgraduate. It's more now three years of postgraduate and usually fellow, fellowship training. Um, this is my credentials, which, which uh, uh, Karen already discussed. I've been with Illinois jo Bone and Joint for 28 years now. I can't believe it's that long. I was here from the inception. The foot. Uh, as as Karen mentions, comprised of 28 bones, muscles, tendons, ligaments, blood vessels, and nerves. The, and that's just a, a, a bare bones of a, a skeleton of a foot and what it looks like. Uh, multiple bones, as you can see from the diagrams here, everywhere from, from the digits to the metatarsals to the cuneiforms to the talus to the calcaneus, all, all things that uh, can cause problems. And that's just a diagram of uh, the blood vessels and the nerves and the tendons from SEBA. The ankles comprise of two bones and many ligaments. And that's what the ankle uh, mortis looks like or the housing of your ankle. And, and then there's a schematic or uh, bones of the uh, foot and ankle. And there's the many ligaments that uh, are, are seen in the, in the ankle. These are the ligaments here. So we'll start out with nail and skin problems. There's ingrown nails, there's fungal nails, there's athlete's foot, there's warts, there's corns and calluses. Those are nails. Those are nails that haven't been addressed for, for a while, uh, but those are ingrown or rams nails. And you can see that uh, she has a callus right here on the inside of her big toe joint. That's a fungal nail, a nail that's thicker uh, and, and, and usually crumbly. Um, and that's indicative of a, of a fungal nail. Not all thick nails are fungal nails, but this in particular is a, is a fungal nail. Sometimes it can have an odor to it. That's an ingrown nail. As you can see, the nail should be growing straight across. And in this case, it grows into the sides and can cause pain. Most generally, it causes pain when it grows out to the tips of the toes where nerve endings are and shoes and pressure, put pressure in that area and cause discomfort and pain. Uh, treatment for this is basically just cutting the sides out um, pedicurists can uh, address this and treat this. <clears throat> uh, athlete's foot, pick it up at a gym now that everybody's back working out at health clubs, taking showers or going swimming since it is swimming season. Uh, you can pick up athlete's foot. Sometimes it blisters. You can see a little rash or redness in this area. Sometimes it's interdigitally between the toes. It'll get macerated. Sometimes it just itches. Um, and basically you want to take, treat that with like an anti antifungal. <clears throat> and some cortisone cream to, for the itching. That's a wart. As you can see, they can occur anywhere on the foot. A wart is a virus. Excuse me. Viruses are, are vas very vascular. Warts are very vascular lesions. Uh, you can see here in this area, it's underneath the foot. What happens with warts is it becomes, there's absence of skin lines. 
uh, and it becomes somewhat of a macerated lesion. They bleed. Sometimes they become thickened and calloused and cause pain. Um, and that's, again, another wart. Again, it's a very vascular lesion. Uh, after it's been trimmed up, you can see it's, we're kind of lopping off the heads of the blood vessels, and, and, and they do bleed. <clears throat> That's a callus. Difference between a callus and a wart. Callus doesn't have any blood vessels to it. It's just, uh, it's kind of a hot spot in the foot where the uh, most of the pressure occurs in the foot and becomes thickened and, and can cause pain. Um, I had a gentleman today who had a, a callus at the tip of the toe. He thought it was a splinter and was, was trying to dig it out and trying to dig it out. And three months later, he came in and it's just a callus that he thought was a, was a, uh, a splinter. Uh, calluses, corns occur on the on the toes typically, and you can see there's a little nucleated corn on the fifth toe, usually caused from rubbing in shoe gear. Pressure uh, aggravates that. Bone and joint problems. We've got hammer toes. We've got bunions. We've got arthritis, Taylor's bunions, and metatarsalgia. This is uh, these are hammer toes. As you can see, the toes are contracted. Uh, and they're buckled, if you will. <clears throat> Sometimes hammer toes will cause a, uh, a, a metatarsalgia, or pain in the ball of the foot, because there's retrograde force that occurs at the toe and causes pain and discomfort in the ball of the foot. That's a, a schematic of what's called a hammer toe. As you can see, it's at the first joint. Uh, typically, people can get a, a this will rub on shoes and cause a, uh, a callus to form or a corn to form in that area. As you can see, those are claw toes. Claw toes means that the, the toe is completely contracted at both joints, at this joint and at that joint there. That's what's called a claw toe. You can see that it, this, the joint is buckled at this level, at this level, and this level, and it kind of looks like a claw. <laughs> That's what's called a mallet toe. The tip of the toe is is, uh, uh, protrude, is it pointed downward and causing pressure uh, on the ground, and that's what's rubbing instead of the pulp of the toe, which is underneath your toe, rubs uh, where it should be rubbing the pulp of the toe. The distal tip of the toe is uh, is what rubs and cause and could cause a callus in that area as well. Bunions. Uh, this is what's called a bunion. It's a deformity that occurs at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. Um, they become painful. Uh, people have difficult time finding shoe gear to fit. Uh, they can rub. Um, pressure can cause pain because there's a nerve that courses in that area. Um, <clears throat> and then you get the, the deviation of the toe. There's a wide array of bunions. There's mild, moderate, and, and severe. Uh, mild bunions can cause discomfort. I can tell you personally, I had a bunion deformity, uh, and it was a mild deformity, and I was, and it kept bothering me every time I worked out, or or if I bumped it, and basically it was it was a mild deformity, and the and there were some cystic changes in the in the head of the bone that was causing pain for me, and I personally had a bunion surgery. Uh, Lily Tomlin had a bunion, and uh, she was I was at a convention, and she was we were talking, and she wanted to show me her bunion, and that's. That's me pointing to Lily Tomlin's bunion. Uh, this is a bunion here with a hammer toe. You can see the prominence of the big toe joint here. And this is called lucky toes. The toes are crossing. Um, the big toe and the second toe have a war. The second toe always loses and rides over the top of the big toe. And over the course of time can be obviously become symptomatic. Usually it's the second toe that causes people pain. Uh, and usually, but you have to fix the bunion to, to correct the toe, so you create space for the second toe. <clears throat> this is that same patient, uh, a pre-op x-ray. You can see the bunion uh, is here, the prominence of the big toe joint medially here. You can see the second toe is starting to cross over. This is post-operatively that same patient after the bunion's been corrected and the toe's been corrected. You can see it's a rectus straight uh, big toe joint and a rectus uh, second digit as well. <clears throat> this is, uh, again, pre-op and post-op, that same patient <clears throat> happens to be a male, uh, pre-op and post-op uh, x-rays of the bunion surgery and the hammer toe surgery. This is a, a recent patient that had a severe bunion. You can see the inner, the angle between the first bone and the second bone is uh, significantly severe. Uh, and with bunions like that, you have to address them at the base 
of the uh, of the uh, first metatarsal to get better alignment, and you can see postoperatively uh, she has a pretty rectus toe. Um, bunions are treated at different at different levels. Uh, the bunions can be treated at the head procedure, which is a pretty mild procedure, and patients are able to walk in a boot postoperatively after they have that procedure performed. Um, bunions that are addressed more proximally, they're more need they need to be uh, non weight bearing. Uh, for a little bit longer period of time so that it allows the bone to heal properly. Uh, arthritis of the big toe joint. As you can see on the uh, left side, this is a normal joint. You can see good joint space. On the right side, you see the joint narrowed and you can see the head is kind of squared off, if you will. And uh, that has caused pain and, and basically the cartilage is worn away uh, on the first metatarsal causing pain because there's nerve endings in the bone and they're getting bone-on-bone -bone pain, similar to what you'd see in the knee or the hip. Uh, treatment for, uh, and this is a, an arthritic, arthritic foot, somebody that had previous surgery, um, had arthritic changes at the first metatarsal head, and this patient underwent a fusion of the big toe joint, and we also addressed the, uh, the digits and, and, and uh, took out the metatarsal heads to give her a rectus uh, uh, foot. This is a, typically a, uh, fusions of the big toe joint are, are performed with screws. Sometimes you use plates and basically you weld the joint together. Uh, many times patients will come in and say, well, uh, you know, doc, uh, my toe's not going to bend. And the question that I have for them is I say, well, how much does it bend now? It doesn't. So you're not going to lose much motion because you don't have much motion and pain causes motion. In order to stop the pain, you have to stop the motion. Hence, you fuse the joint. This procedure is time tested. Uh, it's been around for for many years, and uh, and it and it works very well uh, for patients that have arthritic changes, or even patients that have a severe bunion uh, that don't want to uh, have a basal or procedure where they have to be non weight bearing for long periods of time. You can address a, a, a severe bunion deformity at the big toe joint by fusing it. Uh, again, this is what arthritis is. You can see here the joint space is narrowed in this picture. This is an oblique view. You really don't see much joint space or black space in that area uh, where the, the uh, cartilage is. Taylor's bunion. This is a Taylor's bunion, which is on the outside of the foot. The way the this uh, bunion got uh, uh, named is you saw this a lot of, many times in tail, people that were tailors. Uh, they would operate the sewing machines with the lateral side of their foot constantly pushing in this area. Hence, they would get a big bump on the lateral side of the uh, fifth metatarsal, and that is what is called a Taylor's bunion or a bunionette, if you will. Uh, metatarsalgia. Metatarsalgia usually occurs typically from hammer toes. As the toe contracts, it puts retrograde force in the ball of the foot in this area. The first ray and the fifth ray have their independent ranges of motion. So typically you don't see that in the first or the fifth ray. You typically see it in the second, third, or fourth metatarsal head areas. Uh, this is somebody that has dislocated toes. So as you can see, if we look at the fourth toe here, you can see a joint, you see the toe, and you see the joint space, and you see the metatarsal. You can see three is kind of deviated laterally, and two, is basically sitting on top of the metatarsal. And that is driving the second metatarsal into the ground. And that is the hot spot causing discomfort and pain in that area. Metatarsalgia is what it's typically called, it could be called capsulitis if it's not as prominent. And this is kind of a schematic of, uh, of the metatarsals. Um, as you can see here, this is uh, the, uh, the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth metatarsals are all unhappy. They're, and typically you'll see that in patients that have what's called fat pad atrophy. Over the course of time, you lose the fat pad in the ball of your foot and it becomes uh, symptomatic and the, the, the pain occurs over all the metatarsal heads. And that's why you see all these guys have sad faces. <clears throat> in this next, uh, the one, the second one down, the uh, this is more of a sesamoiditis. The two little P bones here are unhappy because the first is being driven into the ground. Sometimes you'll see this in people that have a very high arched foot or cavus foot uh, because that uh, it's a tripod effect. The pressure goes on the heel, the subfirst and the subfifth metatarsal area, 
The third schematic here, this is more of a tripod effect. The first and the fifth get uh, 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 most of the pressure and it, that's what causes pain. This one is more the fourth as what was seen in the, the picture previously. And then here you can see the second and third are unhappy. And again, the second, third, and fourth metatarsals are static bones, they don't move. The first and fifth have their own independent range of motion. So that's typically why you don't see it in the sub first or sub fifth area. And then this is just a blown up picture of the unhappy metatarsals. And usually, you know, if it's a sub second, it's typically capsulitis. It can be also sub third, but typically sub second capsulitis can occur. And usually a hammer toe is usually a predisposing factor to getting capsulitis or metatarsalgia. Why does that happen? Typically, it's the second toe. The toe is putting retrograde force on the bone behind it. This is what you'll see in a Harris mat. It's an ink mat. Um, pa a patient will walk over this mat and it shows, as you can see, the dark spots are where their, their, their pressure points are in the foot. In this patient, it's the second and third metatarsal heads, a little bit of pressure in the fifth metatarsal head. Heel pain, very common uh, uh, problem in the foot and ankle. Typically, uh, you'll see people with uh, plantar fasciitis, which is very common. And people with heel spurs, and we'll talk about that. Haglund's deformities are called pump bumps, usually seen more in women because of uh, high heel shoes, or young girls have this uh, problem more commonly. Insertional Achilles tendonitis is in the back of the heel. So this is the plantar fascia, this white band on the bottom of the foot. It inserts at the heel in the medial tubercle of the calcaneus, which is right in this area. And it also inserts in the ball of the foot. And typically uh, the plantar fascia becomes symptomatic. Usually the patient population that you see plantar fasciitis in is people that are overweight, people that are very active, people that are getting older, people don't stretch enough and the plantar fascia gets uh, uh, irritated and uh, <clears throat> inflamed. Typically, stretching and support is the gold standard, conservative measures uh, for treating plantar fasciitis. Uh, sometimes if you don't treat plantar fasciitis or plantar fasciitis that's been persistent for a long time can proceed and move on to what's called plantar fasciosis. Plantar fasciosis is more of a, a chronic condition of the plantar fascia. The, uh, the blood supply to the plantar fascia becomes petered out and the, uh, the inflammatory response to the heel um, doesn't, the heel doesn't respond and the body doesn't respond to treatment. Uh, usually with something that progresses on to plantar fasciosis, I've been treating it with, with a procedure called a topaz procedure, which is basically stimulating blood flow to the plantar fascia. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, radial frequency waves. It's pretty uh, benign procedure. Uh, I did this procedure, I've been doing it for probably about 16, 17 years now. And one of my residents did a, a study on my patients that did that I did topaz plantar fasciotomies on. And they found, they, they over the 11 year period, I did 30, 33 patients, 36 patients. So clearly not an overused procedure over, and uh, of the, of the 36 patients, they were able to get a hold of 20 patients. And of the 20 patients, 85% of the patients said that they would do it again because it did help them. Uh, so definitely uh, don't know, uh, the, 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 uh, Dr. Tasto, who's a uh, orthopedic surgeon out of uh, San Diego, and he worked with the San Diego Padres. I was at a, at a conference with him and he was basically showing the, the topaz procedure and they were doing it for tennis elbow. They were doing it for Achilles, uh, for uh, patellar tendonitis. And and basically asked him, so so what do you how do you think this works? He goes, I couldn't tell you, but it works. And he's absolutely right. The topaz plantar fasciotomy stimulates blood flow uh, to the plantar fascia for patients that fit that criteria of plantar fasciosis. Um, heel spurs. The heel spur is not the problem. Uh, many people will say they have a heel spur, and we know that the the, the heel spur is not the problem because I see patients that have a heel spur and no heel pain, and I ask them, does your heel hurt? They say, no, my heel doesn't hurt. So then there's patients that don't have a heel spur, but have heel pain. And so we know that it's not the spur that causes the problem. We know it's the plantar fascia that's causing the discomfort in the heel uh, <clears throat> for that problem. 
Uh, Haglund's deformities, this is a Haglund's deformity. It's basically a bump in the back of the, uh, the heel, typically uh, uh, shoe gear, younger uh, girls' shoes and women's shoes are slaves to fashion. They're lower cut. They cut across this area and can cause what's called a Haglund's deformity. Um, this is a, a patient that has insertional Achilles tendonitis. The Achilles tendon inserts here. Over the course of time, the Achilles tendon has been pulling and pulling. The body reacts to stress and strain. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the tendon is pulling on the Achilles tendon, or pulling on the heel bone. The heel bone says, hey, we got a lot of stress down here. We got to produce some bone. Hence, it produces a spur. Sometimes the spur is asymptomatic. You do nothing. If it becomes symptomatic, you treat it conservatively. If conservative measures fail, you basically have to detach the Achilles tendon, respect, resect all this bony prominence back here, and reattach the, uh, the Achilles tendon. <clears throat> Nerve pain, uh, neuromas, tarsal tunnel. What is a neuroma? A neuroma is a mass that's usually typically in between the third and fourth intermetatarsal spaces or metatarsal heads, as you can see here. A nerve is typically like uh, angel hair pasta, if you will. And angel hair pasta is running between here and then it splits off into the second and third toes. Again, you got a nerve, the common pronial, common digital nerve splits off into two digital nerves. Over the course of time, seen more in women than men because women wear tighter shoe gear, the, the shoes compress, the, uh, the metatarsals get pushed together and they piston. And what happens is it develops scar tissue around the nerve. So you have angel hair pasta and you have a pea or sometimes a, 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 a cannelloni bean in between there, which causes pain and discomfort um, in that area. Nerve pain, it can be electric shock in between the toes. It can be uh, some of the symptoms. I walk barefoot and it feels like I'm walking on a marble. Um, electric shock, shoe pressure. Sometimes patients walk and it starts to bother them. They have to take their shoe off and massage between the toes. Uh, that's classic for a neuroma. Uh, sometimes neuromas can be um, uh, misdiagnosed as uh, uh, capsulitis. Um, and, and typically uh, it's more physical findings and physical exam that will diagnose a neuroma. Um, sometimes we do ultrasound to, to diagnose or do even just see the size of the nerve prior to for doing some doing something surgically. Conservative therapy for neuromas, my first line of defense is to inject them to quiet them down. Excuse me. If conservative therapy fails, then you could take out the nerve. You're not going to lose any function. Uh, it's basically a sensory branch. Sometimes you can have a little numbness in between the third and fourth toes, um, but numbness is better than pain is the rationale for taking it out and it's a very successful operation. Tarsal tunnel, uh, on the inside of your ankle, you have uh, three tendons. This is the posterior tibial tendon. This is the flexor tendon to the toes. This is the flexor tendon to the, the big toe. And in between these two structures, you have the artery and the nerve. Sometimes what happens with tarsal tunnel, similar to carpal tunnel in the wrist, but not as common, uh, the the nerve gets in, inflamed and irritated. Some more, sometimes it's seen in people with a flat foot where all these structures get pushed up against the retinaculum and that can cause a tarsal tunnel type pain. Uh, burning, tingling, pins and needles type pain. Um, diagnosed with, uh, with a nerve conduction study or EMG by a neurologist. Um, sometimes you'll inject them and they get better, sometimes supporting the foot. Uh, with an orthosis can, can help that air, uh, alleviate the, the pressure of that area. Tendon problems, uh, tendonitis, tendon ruptures, tendon tears, posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, also known as flat foot. So if we go back to this picture here, this is these are the main tendons of the inside of the ankle, the posterior tibial tendon, the, uh, the flexor tendon, and the, the uh, flexor hallucis tendon, which is again to the big toe. That slide again. <clears throat> the Achilles tendon is in the back side of the ankle here, and that's that white structure and allows you to propel and, and push off. Uh, sometimes people can get uh, Achilles tendonitis. The, the Achilles tendon gets inflamed. Sometimes patients will get a little bit bulbous attitude to the Achilles tendon, uh, thickens, 
uh, physical therapy, immobilization, orthotics can help Achilles tendonitis, mainly stretching. A lot of times people don't stretch enough. Um, that's one thing that I found as I'm getting older, I have to stretch more. And, and it's no longer, you know, when I see kids jump out on a basketball court, which used to be me, and, uh, you know, in my 20s, I just jump out there to get in the next game. Well, I didn't have to worry about things then, but now I can't do that. It's a bozo no-no. Tendon ruptures and tears. This is a, a peroneal tendon. Uh, it's on the lateral side of your foot. And what happens is sometimes uh, this patient uh, worked for United Airlines and he stepped off, a, he, he misstepped off a uh, toolbox and they thought he had an ankle sprain. Well, he didn't have an ankle sprain. He had a tendon rupture and his peroneal tendon was torn linearly. And basically it's like a little, having a, a piece of rope and taking a slit in it, and making a slit in it. And that's what you see is the tendons torn. So basically you got to resect this, clean this up and tubularize the tendon because the tendon is literally like a piece of rope. It's cylindrical. And in this particular case for peroneal tendon tears, they become flattened and, and they have tears in them like this. That's, that's what the tendon looks like after you tubularize it. That's the same patient that we cleaned up the tendon, retubularized the tendon, and it looks basically like a normal tendon and allows the body to heal the tendon. Achilles tendon ruptures, basically it happens, it can happen at any age. The lowest, the youngest age that I've had is for an Achilles tendon rupture has been a 16 year old volleyball player. It can happen nowadays with a, a lot of patients that are playing pickleball. It's an explosive a, a, a push off type of uh, action. Uh, what will, a patient will say is they'll turn around if they're playing pickleball, why did you hit me in the back of the ankle with your racket? And they turn around and they look and the guy's nowhere near them. Or somebody will say, it feels like somebody kicked me in the back, but there's nobody there. Well, basically it's the Achilles tendon that's been torn. Achilles tendon basically looks like this. It's like taking a horse hair and cutting it in the center. And it's like having a bunch of horse hairs on both sides. Treatment for Achilles tendon ruptures, basically repairing them. Uh, to get you back to, to uh, activity. Uh, and, and that's the way you treat an, an Achilles tendon rupture. And that's what the Achilles tendon looks like after it's been repaired, uh, <clears throat> trying to put it back to its normal anatomy. Posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. Posterior tibial tendon dysfunction is basically a flat foot deformity. Uh, most of the time, posterior tibial tendon dysfunction occurs in people that have what's called a varus foot type. Their forefoot is inverted with respect to their rear foot, non-weight bearing, and when they go to stand, and again, let me backtrack a second, the, re, the, the, the function of the foot is a mobile adapter and a rigid lever. It's a mobile adapter so it adapts to any surface that you're on, whether it be a flat surface, uneven terrain, your foot pronates and supinates to get it flat on the ground so that it allows you to propel and gives you stability. It is also a rigid lever, so it can propel and allow you to push off. Posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, again, is with flat-footed person. The tendon on the inside of the ankle here gets stretched out. The analogy that I use is like dry rot of an elastic waistband. You dig into the drawer right now because it's swimming season coming up. You, you find that pair of swim trucks that you haven't seen in a while, and you pull it out. Wow, I haven't seen these in a while. And you stretch out the waistband, and you hear and your hands stay out here. It's lost its elasticity to recontract and, and basically continues to stretch out and become symptomatic and painful. You, and you can see in this patient uh, on a single leg, single leg toe raise, the left side, the heel inverts, the right side doesn't invert. It's still outside uh, of, the, of the, the, the bisection of the, uh, the tibia here, the leg. And that's indicative of a, uh, a posterior tibial tendon dysfunction or a flat foot deformity where the heel goes outward, the foot collapses, patients will complain of pain on the inside of their ankle. Uh, many times this can be tendonitis. It starts out as tendonitis. Supporting the foot is the, is the, is the appropriate treatment. Um, orthosis uh, uh, devices, supporting it is the treatment. Physical therapy is beneficial as well with this. Worst case scenario, I'd say 85% of the people that get treated conservatively with posterior tibial tendon dysfunction do pretty well. Uh, I'd say about 15% of my populace and of patients uh, proceed to, um, to surgical intervention for this. 
Uh, and again, here's a here's a patient with a, a flat foot deformity. That same patient you can see when they're standing. The left side is pretty rectus. The the right side is collapsing on the inside of the arch. And again, this is what it looks like head on. You can see here the foot is collapsing on the inside. The uh, the the ankle bone is coming down to the ground. Here's a patient that that uh, had a uh, flat foot deformity, but also had some other uh, distal tibia. Uh, deformities, and you can see this is pre-op. Her foot is going outside. It's not supporting her leg. This is uh, post-op on the bottom. You can see now that the, uh, the the heel and the foot is underneath the leg to give it support. And again, this is a patient that underwent uh, surgical intervention. And you can see the deformity. Everything was pushed outward here. This is post-operatively after the, uh, the, uh, the flat foot uh, has been corrected. At, in two different planes to get her uh, uh, left foot underneath her leg, uh, period. <clears throat> uh, metatarsal fractures, foot fractures in general, metatarsal fractures, stress fractures, sesamoid fractures, fifth metatarsal fractures are all very common in the foot. These are, are fractures themselves. Um, this is a stress fracture. Many times people will say, what's the difference between a stress fracture and a fracture? And the analogy that I give them is if I were to give you a pencil and said, break this in two, what would you do? Snap. That is what's called a fracture. A stress fracture is now if I gave you a piece of aluminum or piece strip of metal, uh, aluminum, and said, break this in two, how would you do it? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to bend it and bend it and bend it. So think about a pop can. You bend a pop can to, to break it in half or tear it in half. The bending is the stress. That is what heats up the bone. As you proceed and continue to, to do activity as you're having pain, then it starts to fracture through. So think about that piece of metal. You're bending and bending and bending, and now you can start to tear through it that's a stress fracture. You're not always going to see a stress fracture on x-ray. Uh, I treat x-ray, I treat people, I don't treat x-rays just because I don't see it on an x-ray doesn't mean it's not there and I treat it accordingly. Uh, many times uh, uh, at this point in time I've seen many people with vitamin D deficiency which contributes to stress fractures or stress reaction. Um, I order typically anytime I do bone work and in surgery or anybody that comes in with a fracture, I check their vitamin D level. And I could tell you anecdotally, um, I would say that probably 67% to 70% of the people that I test for vitamin D are low. Many people will come in and say, uh, well, I take vitamin D. And I say, well, if the train is moving 30 miles an hour and you're 30 miles behind the train, how fast you have to go to catch the train. So the question to that is, are you taking enough vitamin D? How do you know your level? The way to know that is by getting a vitamin D test to make sure, make sure that your vitamin D level is adequate for bone healing. If your vitamin D level is low, body doesn't absorb calcium. What does bone need to be strong? Calcium. These are just uh, different, uh, 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 bone scans of people that had stress fractures and stress reactions. Uh, fifth metatarsal fractures. This is an oblique fracture of the fifth metatarsal here. Um, <clears throat> again, I see a lot of fractures and, and, and I think the main contributing factor systemically is vitamin D deficiency along with the mechanism. Um, again, this is an oblique fracture of the fifth metatarsal. This is a... Uh, fractured sesamoid here. You can see the fracture in this area here. Um, I was, uh, uh, what happens with sesamoid fractures, somebody can step off a curb and what happens, the big toe goes up and it can pull apart the bone. Excuse me. Sometimes people have bipartite sesamoids where the, the body hasn't completely ossified and became one bone and there's fibrous tissue between the two pieces of bone um, and they do some type of twisting activity or motion or push off and it it, it, it wrenches the uh, fibers and that could cause symptoms in addition to sesamoid fractures. 
This is a, a fractured fifth metatarsal base here. This is what's called a Jones fracture. Um, you can see, and this, this type of fracture here, the blood supply to the bone is not the greatest. Um, in my hands, I've been treating this with fixing this because I think uh, it's the fastest road to recovery. People that want to treat this, this problem non-operatively, you're in a cast non-weight-bearing for about 10 weeks. If you treat it surgically, you put a screw across there, you're non-weight-bearing non for about four weeks, and we start weight-bearing you and get you back into a shoe about six weeks. And this is all done percutaneously through a small incision uh, with, the, with the techniques now and, <clears throat> uh, and the technology. We're able to put this big screw down the shaft of the bone through a very small skin incision. Uh, ankle problems, sprains, fractures, and arthritis. Again, these are all the ligaments in, in the ankle that, uh, uh, that, that one has. Uh, ankle fractures, uh, people can misstep. Uh, uh, black ice is a very common where you can fracture and displace your ankle. The, the uh, fibula is fractured here. The medial malleolus is fractured here. This is a displaced ankle fracture that needs to be addressed and fixed. Uh, this is, again, just a fibular fracture that needs to be addressed because it's unstable. Uh, usually do a what's called a gravity stress x-ray to see if it opens up. If, it, if, the, if the medial clear space in this area here opens up, it's typically an unstable ankle fracture that needs to be addressed and fixed. Arthritis of the ankle. As you can see, this is arthri arthritis of the ankle. You can see the spurs in the front of the ankle. Uh, this is uh, bone on bone in the, uh, the ankle joint here. Uh, you can see the difference. This is a patient that had an ankle fracture, and not always, but sometimes ankle fractures can proceed on to uh, ankle arthritis. Um, and you can see this is on the right side. This is a good ankle joint. You can see good joint space here. On the left side uh, of the screen, you see decrease in joint space and bone-on-bone -bone, uh, arthritis of the ankle joint. <clears throat> Usually, you can fix these with ankle fusion, which is my gold standard. Uh, I do not do ankle implants, um, but uh, ankle implants are also uh, becoming more in vogue. Um, the difference between the ankle implants and the knees, there's greater surface area for knee joint implants. That's why they can stand the test of time. Typically the ankle implants, because it's such a small space and higher force, um, and the surface area isn't as great, Typically, when you have an ankle implant, depending upon your age, typically you have to, to have the, uh, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the uh, poly uh, changed out, and sometimes it has to be redone and modified. <clears throat> Systemic diseases, gout, peripheral vascular disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and diabetes all manifest themselves in the foot. Um, what is gout? Gout is overproduction of uric acid or under excretion of uric acid typically occurs in the big toe joint or the ankle joint. I've also seen it in the second toe most recently. Uh, what are the symptoms? Red, hot, swollen, painful joint. Patients will also say even the bed sheets bother it. Uh, and usually what we do is do lab work. Sometimes I'll inject the joint to give them some relief. There's uh, also oral medication that patients take, Coltracine, <clears throat> cold cry uh, for acute gout, uh, for chronic gout usually refer them to rheumatologists who will put them on allopurinol. And that's basically what gout looks like, red, hot, and swollen, inflamed big toe joint. Peripheral vascular disease, <clears throat> seeing some of the symptoms, cold feet, night pain, rest pain, absence of pulses, shiny skin, no hair growth, sores that don't heal on the foot. Uh, those are all indications of uh, patients with uh, 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 peripheral vascular disease. What is night pain or rest pain? Patients won't complain of pain till they lay down to go to bed. And what happens is as they're horizontal, gravity doesn't pull blood down to the feet, which causes them to have pain. Um, typically they'll tell me, oh, I, I have to sit up and let my feet dangle over the side of the bed uh, to give me uh, some relief. <clears throat> this is uh, somewhat someone with a vascular disease, shiny skin, integument. Uh, sometimes they'll get ruber with dependency or pallor with elevation. Ruber with dependency is something that uh, where your foot becomes really flush red uh, when it's dangling. And if you lift it up, it becomes pallorous or, or white color. 
Uh, again, this is that same foot, just a different angle. Uh, what happens with vascular disease? People can get gangrenous toes. Uh, this blood supply to the fifth toes basically died and it's kind of uh, declared itself as where the, the good tissue is and the bad tissue is. <clears throat> Again, this is a motor vehicle accident. So this is somebody that had just scabs over their feet. They didn't lose any of their toes. They got lucky. Rheumatoid arthritis. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is basically an inflammation of the joints, and, and it can hurt, and it can happen at usually the foot and all the ball of the foot joints. Um, you get dislocated toes, and it can look something like this. Um, <clears throat> this is another rheumatoid patient that has a bunion deformity and also a dislocated toe and a prominent callus due to the dislocation of the toe. Diabetic foot, neuropathy, PVD, uh, non-healing ulcers. That's a diabetic ulcer. Diabetic ulcers occur because patients have insensate foot. They don't feel anything. Uh, they, can, they can step on a, 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 for instance, what does that mean? If I walk and I feel a, 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 a pebble in my shoe, I stop, I, I take off my shoe, I dump it upside down, out rolls the pebble. The diabetic patient with an insensate foot, literally two hours of light sheer force, you pushing on your, your hand just like this for two hours will create an ulcer. And diabetics, because they don't have any feeling, end up breaking down. Usually a diabetic patient that has an ulcer on the bottom of their foot usually doesn't know to notice the ulcer until they see their sock and see some drainage on the sock. And they say, they start thinking, did I step on some water? Why is my sock discolored like that? Finally, they look at the bottom of their foot and by that time the horse is usually out of the barn. Again, diabetic ulcer at the tip of the, tip of the toe. Again, another diabetic ulcer in the, the fifth metatarsalate area. Uh, also become, this is someone that also has some vascular disease. You can start to see the dusky changes at the tip of the toe becoming necrotic. Sports injuries, tendonitis, sprains, Achilles tendonitis, ankle rupt or Achilles tendon ruptures and fractures all seen uh, in the sports population. And uh, that's basically it. Uh, and my, my, my sweet, my, my patient's dog, Sweet Pea, after he started jumping rope with four feet, then he became a rope jumper with two feet. It was really a truly amazing dog. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. And I don't know. And that's the end of the lecture. Uh, I cannot hear you. Well, that would be because I'm muted. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. I have a quick question for you, yes, um, and, and then I'll get to everybody else's. But you know, you, you had all of those pictures of all of the people with the, the toe and foot deformities. Are there shoe brand makers out there who make shoes for people with foot deformities? Is there a brand that you know of, or are there shoes out there for people? The answer to that is yes and no. Um, Okay. There are shoes for diabetics, um, a higher toe box shoe, a super depth shoe, an extra depth shoe um, for patients that need it, um, that, that the toes are rubbing. Um, that would be a, a, a shoe recommendation is a super depth shoe or an extra depth shoe. Okay. Um, with respect to gym shoes and things like that, the, the gym shoes now are, are pretty much nylon and they're, they're softer on the top. They're not as much leather. Um, and, and those shoes can be helpful to, to patients. <clears throat> Great, thank you. That might be a market out there for somebody. And you speaking know. of shoes, just to give you a little shoe education. So with respect to a shoe, what is a good gym shoe? And I see a lot of the companies nowadays, uh, the, the Nike Light or the Free or the whatever, in my opinion, kind of like the Chuck Taylor Converse shoe, garbage. They don't, there's no support to that shoe. When you're buying a gym shoe, one thing you want to look at is the heel counter of the shoe. The heel counter of the shoe should be rigid. You shouldn't be able to flop this down. That's what holds your foot in the shoe. And also a good stability of the sole to give you good support is another thing with respect to the shoe. Next time you go to a shoe store, pick up a shoe and push on the heel counter. Put it through the test and see what it, see what it looks like. Again, I see a lot of women wearing the Ked shoes or the Puma shoes. No support. 
you need a shoe with with good support especially if you're an athlete or doing playing pickleball or uh, just be maybe an avid walker good supportive shoe gear is important awesome thank you that's really helpful thank you very much yep all right are you ready yes ma'am okay uh what does heel burning indicate uh heel burning could be could be a nerve issue uh could be plantar fasciitis could be achilles tendonitis those are things that can cause a burning sensation of the heel awesome thank you how much can an mri help a doctor diagnosing heel pain good question so my rule of thumb and my philosophy is i order a test if it's going to change the way i'm going to treat something so i'm not going to waste your money with respect to an mri um and many patients come in oh i need an mri well stop well, what have you had first okay everybody wants to jump to the bazooka without taking care of the the, the simple things you know the they want the, i mean it's like trying to kill an ant with a with a with a bazooka you're not going to do it so if it's going to change the way you're going to treat something you order the test what does that mean well okay somebody's not getting better an ultrasound is something i use for let's say let's let's use plantar fasciitis because that was the question Personally, I think a ultrasound is, is a better modality than an MRI for plantar fasciitis. And the plantar fasciitis with an ultrasound can see if it's plantar fasciosis. And again, there's a difference. Plantar fasciitis is an acute condition. Plantar fasciosis is a chronic condition. Mm -hmm. So an MRI, okay, so if you get the diagnosis of plantar fasciitis, how is that going to change the, the treatment? It's not. So right. you're ordering an expensive test that's not going to change the treatment. So it doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> Great. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Next one. I have heel pain, but don't have pain after sleeping and getting up, which I hear is a symptom of plantar fasciitis. Is there anything I can do for the heel pain besides icing at night? Stretch. Uh -huh. Stretch, stretch, and more stretching. Wear good shoe gear. Uh, you know, you can even try an over-the-counter arch support. But and for stretching, are you talking like a, uh, like like a heel like a like, uh, like the heel, heel stretch? Stretch yeah. the towel, pull a, put a towel around the ball of your foot and pull. Okay, great, you thank you. Stretching on a wall, stretching on a step. Yep. And so, so what you would do is stretch your Achilles. Yes, okay. exactly. Because the awesome. Achilles, the plantar fascia is confluent with the Achilles tendon underneath the arch of the underneath the heel of the foot. <clears throat> great, thank you. Okay, with arthritis and bunions. I continue to walk two to three miles a day. Is that harmful or beneficial? And then in parentheses, she, she has like the motion is lotion theory. So the answer to that is, if you're not having any pain, do nothing. Um, if it's causing pain, then it's a reason to do something. Now, I see patients that have arthritis and what happens, well, it started out having pain in the big toe joint, but now it doesn't hurt anymore. Well why is that the case well because maybe they've started to compensate instead of walking and towing off they're walking on the lateral side of the their foot and now they're affecting their knee their hip and their back and long term not a good idea so fixing the problem is with respect to arthritis of the big toe joint is sometimes what needs to be done but if you're not having pain i don't think you need to do anything okay great thank you all right, someone says they have been dealing with acute tendinopathy for five months and going to PT for months. They're still in a lot of pain. Will this ever get better? So if you continue to have pain and therapy is not working, you have to rest the part. You got to shut it down and let it get better. Um, too many people don't have, don't have, I don't have the time to do that, you know? Well, then right. you got to live with it. So yeah. if, you know, if it continues to bother you, you got to address the problem. And sometimes that means shutting it down and just resting. And uh, I have a guy that's a, that's a, a, a carpenter, uh, works construction. He's got a lot of things going on. And, you know, we did an MRI and he's got stress reaction going on. And I said to him, I said, you know what? We've tried to deal with this in inconveniencing you the least. Yeah. and you're still having problems so at this point in time we i think you got to bite the bullet and just shut it down and rest it unfortunately that's that's what the treatment is going to be <clears throat> gotcha okay thank you all right this person says a year ago my hallie's longest tour 
Now I'm experiencing numbness in my second and third toes. Is this normal? Your health, the longest tour. The, yep. did, did they ever, I mean, you could be, what could be happening with that is you could be getting some compensation of the flexor tendons of the of the second and third that are trying to compensate for the lack of plantar flexion of the big toe, which may be causing it to overwork, which may be causing some symptoms there and some numbness in that area. Maybe it's getting inflamed. <clears throat> Got it. Okay, thank you. All right, and someone asks, what do I do if my plantar fasciitis isn't healing? Question is, is it plantar fasciosis? So yeah, right. I would I would order an ultrasound and 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 see what if it's plantar fasciosis if it's plantar fasciosis then my go to is going to uh, do a topaz procedure. Great, thank you. Can a frayed tendon heal to as good as normal? And I'm wondering if that would be a frayed tendon that has been repaired, but I don't know. It just says can a frayed tendon heal to be as good as normal? So the answer to that is a tendon is not healing on its own if it's frayed. So that's something that you need to probably fix. And again, I could take you back to that slide where the, the right. chronial tendon, where you can see it's like a rope that's been split and cut. Yep. That's a frayed tendon there. So that's not repairing itself. That's something that needs to be addressed and, and fixed because it needs it needs external help with that. Got it, thank you. Because a, a tendon isn't gonna grow itself back together like your skin will. No. Got it, okay, thank you. All right. Um, someone asks, when you were talking about the vitamin D, does does vitamin D impact arthritis? It says it says, well, vitamin D moderate arthritis. That's not going to moderate the arthritis. Vitamin D is going to be more bone pain um, or or stress fractures. Um, and everybody's D. I mean, with respect to bone pain, everybody's threshold is different. Um, and I'll give you an example. My roommate from college who would run triathlons and do all that nonsense you know he's like yeah after i run about like sorry karen nonsense <laughs> it's okay uh, um after about like the fifth mile my 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 ankle would start to bother me ah come in let's take an x-ray come in take an x-ray nothing there and then he'd tell me then he started refing basketball games and he said after about the third game it starts to bother me i said well let's check your vitamin d level he was 17. So put them on high doses of vitamin D. I haven't heard from him. So wow. Yeah. So okay. and again, his was his pain came after the third game of refing, right. running up and down. So if we're walking around, he didn't complain of any pain. It was after doing strenuous exercise or running for three third game was what did him in. <laughs> so do you think everyone should get their vitamin D levels checked when they go for their annual physical? I you know I'm a big proponent of that. Um, I had, uh, this is probably about 14 years ago, um, I had a couple of fractures that were not healing, treated appropriately, non-operatively, and not healing. And I was talking to one of the rheumatologists, Mary Moran at that time, and she goes, check their vitamin D level. And I'm like, okay, and sure enough, and this was before vitamin D was in vogue. Um, now it's pretty vogue, but, uh, uh, and sure enough, Tested, we tested their vitamin D level. Both were low. Put them on high doses of vitamin D, which helped the fractures heal. Awesome. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Uh, and then someone else asks, are you differentiating, differentiating vitamin D deficiency from osteoporosis and are the equivalent risk factors for stress fracture of your foot or ankle bones? So I would I would defer that more to, with, with respect to the osteoporosis to the rheumatologist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people that have osteoporosis, yes, can d develop fractures and their vitamin D level can be normal. But if your vitamin D level isn't normal, I think it's just something, uh, an adjunct to, to helping them with healing. Got it. Okay, super. Thank you. All right. This one person says, I'm active and I lift weights. Can these injuries be preventable or less injured and fast recovery? I think that was at a certain point in your talk and I didn't see when it came in. So I'm not sure which injuries that person is referring to. Um, repeat, repeat the question. If I'm if I'm active and lift weights, can these injuries be preventable or become less injured and have a faster recovery? So depending upon your age, um, your, your tissue is not as resilient as you get older as it is when you're younger. So things that you would do 
when you're younger, I mean, lifting weights is a great idea, but sometimes overdoing it can cause a problem too. Um, so there's a there's as you get older, there's a kind of a balancing act to knowing what you need to do and what you what you can and can't do. For my, I'll give you an example for myself. I was doing a lot of push-ups. Well, then my shoulder started bothering me. Yeah. No good deed goes unpunished. You know, you're trying to get better and it, your shoulder hurts. Then you got to back off because you're trying to do too much. So you, you got to do things in moderation and and kind of know your own body and know what things are aggravating it. And it, if it's something's aggravating, you got to back off of it. Very, yeah, great advice. Thank you. Okay, and then um, someone asks, is there any way to stop arthritis? Not really. If you can figure that out, you'd be a millionaire. Um, yeah. You know, a, a lot of arthritis, again, the rheumatoid arthritis comes from a systemic issue, which rheumatologists are treating. You know, osteoarthritis, um, big toe joint arthritis, it was something, some type of trauma that occurred that caused it, maybe when you're younger, uh, right. and it was manifested as, it, as you got older. Uh, ankle joint arthritis, you have an ankle fracture, sometimes those can go on to arthritis. It's just the nature of the, the depends on what happens to the to the biology and to the to the cartilage uh, and the the assault to the cartilage that can that can is going to be the determining factor. Yeah. But the answer yeah. to that is no. <laughs> well, and that I mean, and that's an honest answer, and it's true. So you know, and and you know, you can you can just try to keep moving, right? And 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 keep motion your joint as flexible flight. as you can. Yeah, yeah. As Sarah said, motion is lotion. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Dr. Immersion, thank you so much. We have hit eight o'clock and a little bit past. I'm sorry to keep you a little bit late, but thank you so much. You answered all the questions that came in. I had a few, but I'll wait and maybe I'll see you one of these days and I'll ask you all mine too. Not a problem. Thank All you right. very much for this opportunity to, to speak to the audience. I appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate you. Thanks for everything, doctor. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a great Day weekend since it's close. Yay for everyone. Absolutely. Take care. You are fabulous. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you.